Hello, and welcome to Virtues of Peace. My name is Hope Elizabeth May. I'm joined by Taylor Ackerman, Michael Buzzy, Randy Olson, and special guest, Frederick Heffermel, who joins us from Oslo, Norway. Thank you, Frederick, for being with us. Thank you. <laughs> so Frederick is an expert on the Nobel Peace Prize. He's written a book called The Nobel Peace Prize, What Nobel Really Wanted. That is published in 2010 by Prager. And you can read more about that book at our show resources page at virtuesofpeace.com. Uh, so actually, just in a couple of days, the deadline for the nominations for the Nobel Peace Prize is coming up. And Frederick Heffermill is an expert on this prize, and he's done a lot of research on the process by which the prize is awarded. We will be talking about that today. He has been a longtime peace activist. Uh, he was the vice president of the International Association of Lawyers Against Nuclear Arms, uh, as well as the vice president of the International Peace Bureau. And just to remind us where we are, uh, we have been doing for the past few weeks shows on the Treaty for the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, which just entered into force a few days ago on the 22nd, uh, just six days ago. And so it's very fitting that Frederick is with us because he's also done a lot of work on nuclear disarmament. And uh, we'll talk about that as well today. And so we'll just begin and just remind people that um, Alfred Nobel in 1895 basically uh, left the funds to award five different Nobel prizes in physics, chemistry, medicine, literature, and peace. And I think the Peace Prize is the most well-known and prestigious. Um, and Frederick is a lawyer and he's brought to bear, you know, the actual legal duties incumbent upon us in awarding this prize. And we'll be talking about that today. So we'll just begin and let's just talk about the legal dimensions of the Nobel Peace Prize. And um, Frederick, in your book, you really talk a lot about the role of intent and that intent is absolutely essential to the proper interpretation of any will, um, and of course of Nobel's. And can you review for, for us, and especially for those who are not professional lawyers, um, the, the law governing wills and trusts and the role of intent therein? Well, I, I think I should say one thing first. Okay. And that is that I have been uh, reproached for uh, my legal uh, accuracy and uh, strict constructionism mm. and so on by mm. the Nobel awarders. Mm. And a friend asked me, have you really worked for 10 years with the Nobel's testament? And I said, no, I worked my whole life. Mm. And I'm not so interested in the testament but in the idea behind it. Mm. Nobel had a visionary idea how to create peace. And the main recipe was to get rid of weapons and warriors. The mm. Nobel Prize awarders uh, have never been willing to respect that. In, in fact, they have uh, <laughs> held the opposite uh, view of, the, of what they should. And they have really suppressed the uh, idea that Nobel had in mind all the time. So mm -hmm. that is the background for my uh, involvement in this. It, it is the idea behind it that is essential to me. And I found that the Testament is one place where the mm -hmm. peace movement has a chance to be heard. It has a legal right to be respected and heard. So it, it is a tool which is very different from all other political discussions. Mm -hmm. Just because it is a legal right for those who were intended to receive the prize by Nobel. That is why the will is so, and, and its content is so important. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, you cannot execute a will without knowing what Nobel wanted. And 
people will think it's about reading the will, but but um, by common language and thinking. Um, but it's not what the words means to you, mm. but it's what they meant to the testator. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, very few, uh, almost no, no one understands this crucial point. Mm. And it's so, in a way, drastic that um, um, as an expert on in, uh, inheritance law has uh, explained it, that the interpretation of wills shall be entirely subjective and in eminent degree individual. What shall apply is what this testator meant in this situation by these words in this connection. Mm. And that's a great job to find out all the evidence that is relevant and can um, uh, help us Ex understand what exactly this testator meant by uh, by the words he used, mm. and 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 um, of course the first thing of all is that the, since this was written, in fact, 125 years ago plus uh, two months, uh, uh, it, it, you have to go into the period, the thinking the ideas, the culture, the language of the period. You have to study Nobel's own language and his situation and his, for instance, he had written a will before. That is one point which can help us understand the words in this will. The difference here can illuminate a lot about the meaning. So that's why, I mean, I got it quite, Relatively, uh, I think I was right uh, from the beginning, but I have got a very much deeper understanding mm. and uh, a much more firm and secure basis for my interpretation of the will in the course of these 13 years I've been working on the subject. Mm. Yeah, so, so as you said, the you know, the, the idea and, uh, you know, the, this, <clears throat> this quote that you read from Ragnar Knopf, um, you, you use this quote in, in your book yeah. about the interpretation of will shall be entirely subjective and in eminent degree individual and what the testator meant in this situation. Um, and I think that, you know, some of us refer to that as intent, but it's really like we have to start with, you know, the words and what this person meant by the meaning of these words yeah. and of course you know the the actual words are the beginning point of the inquiry um and so we'll, we'll get to those words that that are important to getting at his intent but yeah, yeah. I, I think the point here is that we need an analysis and it's like it's almost like we have to go back in history as you say, and really get into the mind and spirit of Nobel and what he's thinking at the time that he makes this document. Um, and I, I believe that your criticism is that the Nobel Committee just doesn't do that searching historic inquiry. Is that, is that a fair assessment? They should have done this in 1897, mm. but they never did it. Mm. In fact, they did the opposite. Mm -hmm. They, I think, uh, this is connected with Norwegian history and we were in union with Sweden and we were wanting independence and we wanted uh, our own relations to other nations. And this was a great gift to the Norwegian parliament mm -hmm. that they should suddenly have something they could offer to the other nations and which made them interesting to other nations. Mm. Uh, so they really wanted to take on this task of appointing the committee of five to, to award the prize. But what they didn't like was one expression which they found uh, among th three um, e expression on the content on the intention of the will, he, he uses the word abolition or reduction of standing armies. This mm. means that there shall be no permanent military institution or force. Mm. It is about a 
a demilitarized world. That is the, a radical, it is the essence of the whole testament and, and his road to peace. Mm -hmm. And that didn't suit them at the time. Mm -hmm. So, in fact, what I have found in my uh, later, this, I, I now have published, uh, after 10 years, I have published a, an entirely new book and a different approach. And it is about how it was not about what Nobel actually wanted. At, that was the first topic. But now it is about the management and how it has been dealt with over all these years. Mm -hmm. and, and there, I must say, I, I was shocked to find that they changed the core element of the testament four years before the first prize was awarded. Mm -hmm. Norwegian, the presidents of the Norwegian parliament uh, must have found out that they were they had changed their view on uh, they were uh, Norway, Norwegian politics had been very pacifist uh, up to the time when Nor uh, Nobel wrote his will in 1895. Nor uh, Norway was very pacifist, but then they uh, had changed because they feared uh, an armed uh, encounter with Sweden to get out of the Union. Mm -hmm. uh, and therefore, pacifism was not in fashion any longer. And quietly, they just threw away the whole idea of the testament. Mm. Yeah, and I, criminal I, act. Right. And um I, I also I I don't know if it was made clear and it's something that I like I I just it wasn't you know clear to me in, until I started uh studying the peace movement. Um one that okay the Nobel Peace Prize is one of several that Nobel went uh uh were left and and second, that the Peace Prize is, is different uh, because, yeah, it is awarded in Norway, whereas the other prizes are awarded in Sweden. Um, and so there's a whole story there, right? And yeah. you're, you're getting at that. And it's because Norway was a pacifist country and, and so forth. And you talk about that in your book. So I, I just want that to sort of our listeners to understand that because I think that's a thing that people don't really understand. And at least... In my circles, when people talk about the Nobel Prize, they don't distinguish which one. So they just refer to it, there's this general term Nobel Prize, yeah. and, they're, and they're not specific about which particular prize it is. And as yeah. you're pointing out, the Peace Prize is very specific, and we have to understand Nobel's specific idea behind this prize, which again requires this historic inquiry which as you say has not been done. And um, a person that we've talked a lot about on this show is Bertha von Sutner. And actually, if you go to our show resources page, as I've said, you can see the cover of Frederick's book. And there's a picture of Bertha von Sutner on the cover, uh, as well as a broken, uh, shattered Nobel Peace Prize. And you say that she is key to understanding the meaning and intent of this prize um and can you can you talk about that uh, like uh, so going into this searching historic inquiry that will lead us to bertha von sutner so how like why is that relationship why is that story of bertha important to understanding the meaning of nobel's wishes here yeah uh, well it's uh, because uh, the inspiration to the prize grew out of the uh, Nobel's uh, uh, friendship with Bertha von Sutner, which started with her coming to his house to help him in Paris. Um, and uh, some years later, they, they had kept up a correspondence, and then uh, Sutner got extremely uh, engaged in the um, idea of peace and, and thinking about peace and develop. And she became the really le real leader of uh, <laughs> an inspire, a central person in the development of peace ideas. Uh, and particularly then with her book, um, Lay Down Your Arms. Uh, Nobel was 
very enthusiastic about the book uh, and said it should have been translated into all <laughs> languages on the planet. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and I, I think um, the, um, the, this was uh, the, this is the main explanation of what the prize was for. It was to support Sutner's idea, ideas, and political ideas and her political friends. Mm. Uh, and and then, of course, this is um, uh, there are many ideas and many periods and the uh, different phases of development of thinking and there are various camps in the, also inside the peace movement so it can be a bit difficult to uh, say from this realization what exactly does that mean but it was then that I now in the working on this latest book, I suddenly discovered that, well, here is a, in the letters, 70 in all our uh, still, uh, we, have st we still have 70 of these letters and they are uh, filled with uh, thinking from Sutner and uh, on, on her piece work and what she wanted his help to for she, um, is uh, in, uh, begging him for money in all, uh, almost all the way, and then understanding uh, her plan, uh, explaining her plans and and uh, and projects, and uh, she sends him all kinds of uh, her, her the letters and the pamphlets and the materials from the movement uh, and it uh, explains its growth and ideas. Mm. So Nobel responds to this uh, uh, and, and, and it ma makes it very clear that how, how much she wants her ideas to succeed. So this combination or this exchange of uh, ideas you know, over uh, five, particularly a period of five years, six years until Nobel died, are an, an extremely good source of evidence for what Nobel had in mind. Mm. So fascinating. And I, I want to go back to like the very beginning where you said you've been reproached for your quote, strict constructionist interpretation of, of the Testament. And um, I mean, I just, I just think it's important, especially, yeah, for people who are not trained in law that, you know, so in considering, you know, these letters between Sutner and Nobel, so these are, you know, extraneous to the, to the will, but these are materials that help us understand the meaning of the words in the will. Is that a fair rendering? Yeah, it is a source to understanding what Nobel meant by his uh, words <laughs> in the Testament. And the words are incidentally, they are also uh, uh, contemporary language. They were uh, words used by the peace movement. Mm. The, the expressions were creating the fellowship of nations. Mm. Uh, abolishing or reduction of standing armies and promoting peace congresses. This is in the middle of the peace movement over the period. Mm. And, and it is incredible that the Nobel awarders uh, have <laughs> gone out of, uh, they have made extreme efforts to, to conceal and they continue to do it. It's the, the best kept secret about the Nobel Prize which there is a lot of secrecy around the award and about uh, around the um, nominations and uh, there is no knowledge of the discussion <laughs> in the committee everything is supposed to be secret mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the best kept secret is the intention of nobel namely a uh, demilitarization of international relations yeah and i i just want to thank you for for you know, actually 
educating us and, and others about this quote secret and, and making it more, <laughs> more known and, and more transparent. And so um, on the show resources page, you can look at uh, Frederick's website, nobelwill.org. The nominations are to be kept secret for 50 years. Um, but what you do, Frederick, one of the things you do is, um, is publish the nominations of candidates who do in fact fit the criteria meant by Nobel and his, his testament. And so that's you know the, the work that Frederick does. And um, let me just open it up to anybody else on the, on the show who may have a question. Yeah, uh, I, I would like to ask Frederick um, one question because we were on the subject of Bertha von Suttner and um, so one of the things that's been fascinating to me is that upon the discovery of Bertha von Suttner as a historical figure, for some reason, learning about her and her story and her influence on the world seems to be part of some kind of surprising, amazing part of uh, everybody who I've ever met's, um, I guess, relationship with her and her mm. story. Like there's something about learning about her that's important. And I'm curious, was there anything, does, does anything come to mind for you um, about like when you discovered that she was a person? Because I know on this side of the world, like Bertha von Suttner is not a name that really flies around all the time. And there's only specific people who seem to even know who she is, let alone understand the impact that she had. So I'm curious, was there anything special that comes to mind about when you learned about Bertha von Suttner? Well, I think uh, there were in the peace movement in Norway when I started actively working for, uh, in, uh, we, we knew about Suttner and there was there were some pamphlets about her. And uh, so I had an awareness of her. Uh, all the time, but what I'm very annoyed at is that it took me so long to understand what uh, that a prize which was, is so well known and so has such high prestige could be uh, you know, managed with so utter disrespect for the actual uh, uh, purpose and the, the rules of law and, and the content of the testament. And, and, and they are in fact I have found in my new book, uh, which probably I, ha I have the manuscript ready for an American publisher any time. <laughs> it, mm -hmm. It's already uh, clear. Um, it, it, the, um, the, no, I, I, I lost my... <laughs> I, lost, um, uh, I, can, I can pull you back in. Um... I was I was trying to find out whether there was anything special about yeah uh, I, I I know I want I, I what I wanted to say is that I have in this book I have found out that there has been a, a direct uh, falsification of history by the historians who were secretaries to the committee or directors of the Nobel Institute they have actually tried to. Uh, for, for, uh, to, to write uh, Bertha von Suttner and, and out of the history, out of, out of uh, uh, deliberately falsified the history. Well, that's, oh, that's, that's horrifying to me, but um, it is. I, I appreciate, I appreciate that. Yeah. Anybody else with a question? Yes. I had a question for you, Frederick. I'm just curious, in your opinion, what is what would you say is the reason why the Nobel Committee has gone about completely disregarding the will of Alfred Nobel and the guidelines laid out in all the documents that you've seen? Do you think it's a political motive? Do you think it's something against him as an individual at the time? Well, it uh, is, uh, I think, uh, uh, I have found a kind of law, a social law, that any attempt to uh, demilitarize the world uh, will meet extreme resistance. There are two different approaches to peace, either to rely on 
force and uh, strength and uh, or to uh, realize that countries are lying where they are and have the neighbors they have they need to get on with their neighbors to have security that is the only way to have security but uh, this uh, i found in my book uh, is a lots of examples of how the arms industry and the uh, profit interests of, of uh, behind that uh, all this um, uh, fuel uh, and and what you call, uh, <laughs> they put a lot of energy into scaring uh, everyone to uh, to believe that they must be strong uh, in brackets in um, in quotation marks uh, and uh, they uh, and th this is uh, a part of the business model uh, and the economy here is so enormous and uh, th that it, it is uh, it very th th that it means a control uh, of uh, a, a very substantial political power of the military uh, which also extends to the, the Nobel Committee. And in the US, you have a terrible example uh, in uh, how the, one of the richest men of his period, uh, 15 years after the Nobel, after Nobel established his prize, Andrew Carnegie sold his steel trust to uh, combat the worst evil in the world, namely war. And uh, he... Uh, established the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace to, to end the worst of all evils, namely war. And when that was organized, the trustees were free to go on to other less important problems. And, and the Carnegie Endowment was changed away from its actual purpose even faster than the Nobel Peace Prize. It was immediate from the beginning. I also deal with that and the parallel in my book as a, um, examples of the, the, the general rule that all efforts to uh, challenge the power of militarism uh, tend to uh, what, fall in line uh, much too soon. Thank you. But I should mention that we, uh, in Nobel Peace Prize Watch, uh, is generating around uh, 20, 30 uh, nominations every year and helping uh, people to get the right uh, persons nominated. And we also publish uh, the uh, nominations uh, online. So I, I think. A main problem with the whole institution of the Peace Prize is all the secrecy, which has uh, helped the awarders uh, uh, to do whatever they liked with the prize. And they have been above the law and have been not had to listen to, uh, to, to criticism. And so they, uh, there is a need for uh, much better transparency around the price, uh, around the candidate, around the idea of the price. And I think the institution of the Peace Prize would be well served by this discussion that will create mm -hmm. uh, uh, understanding and interest and discussion about the issues. Uh, and and the, there I have also found one more thing when in the interpretation in the in this last uh, in, uh, work I done, it is that there has been way too much interest in persons and concentration on selecting persons, and the committee has picked the best one in there, <laughs> picking them best in the uh, file of incoming nominations. But they should have been active and uh, and uh, searched for the best uh, and made sure that the best are nominated. And they, they should, first of all, not um, concentrate on uh, persons, but they should concentrate on the idea behind mm -hmm. the price. The, 
the purpose of demilitarizing international relations as the only uh, we need it more than any time before because we have the climate crisis uh, and we have now the pandemic we have uh, social unrest in america you have enormous social problems uh, and instead you spend the money on wars abroad and on uh, weapons uh, we just cannot afford this we, we are in such a, a, a situation that there is no way around um, friendly cooperation uh, if we are going to pull this to, uh, through and uh, we, we cannot afford uh, going on in the way we have done and and uh, well, if we are able to uh, cooperate on uh, demilitarizing that is I, th I don't think you will ever get rid of nuclear weapons without a realization that the whole uh, institution of militarism and war has to go. Mm. Uh, and once that's done, you will have enormous funds uh, available for other purposes. Thank you, Thank you for those comments, Frederick. Um, <clears throat> <laughs> I just, yeah, I will, we'll go into the nuclear issue, yeah, and, and a little bit indeed. I know you've worked a lot on that as well. And um, I just, again, want to, you know, a, as, a, as a philosopher and also a, a, a lawyer and also just a concerned citizen of the universe, um, again, this, this, like, this issue of interpretation and um, that, like, you really make us remember that this is like very specific to Nobel and his specific vision. And, you know, you use again, this phrase, you've been criticized for the strict construction uh, approach. And I just want to contrast this because we hear these in the United States, when we hear that term strict constructivist, we, we usually hear it in connection with debates about the constitution. And we have these similar ideas where the constitution means what the framers intended by it. And we can't read in, you know, for example, social issues like abortion and, and GLBTQ issues. These are not things that the framers were thinking about. So they should be left to the states. I'm not getting into that debate. I just want to contrast, you know, the constitution from an individual's will or trust and there as you pointed out that the difference here is like it does depend on the individual's mind and self and person um and i just i didn't want people to yeah get confused the you know the strict constructivist constitutional issue and forget that the constitution is very very different from a, from a will which as you pointed out is totally dependent on the individual's intent you also see the same rule in, in charitable giving, that is, um, when an individual, at least in the United States, you know, gives a gift to a university and puts conditions on it, um, the, the donor's intent is controlling, um, and the the institution can can yeah violate the law when the institution starts to spend that money for purposes for which the donor did not intend. Yeah. Um, so it's the same. Yeah, the same idea. Yes, um, it is yep. it's exactly the same. That the, it is a one-sided. Uh, mm -hmm. It is not a contract with two parties uh, where you mm -hmm. have to use a kind of general linguistic norm, but it is the uh, mm -hmm. language of one person that counts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's, that's a special, special thing. Yeah. Such an important point. Um, and so we talked about the, this language. You mentioned the the three criteria, or not? I don't I, criteria. You used to use that word, but not anymore. And we're going to talk about why that is. But there is specific language in the in the the doc or the deed setting out the the peace prize. So you mentioned creating the fellowship of nations, and of course that's an English translation from yes, it was in Swedish, correct? Yeah, Folkens förbrödrande. Okay, there you go. 
This sounds beautiful. So, um, and then the abolition or reduction of standing armies and then promoting peace congresses. So <clears throat> you uh, talking about your new book said, you know, your, your research lately, you don't really look at these things as criteria, but they're guides. And um, can you tell us that about that new research? Did you look at new documents? I know you mentioned the, the letters between um, Nobel and Sutner, but were there other things that you, you've looked at lately? Well, well I, I have been complimented with making a pioneering research by, I mean, the um, files, the, uh, um, the archives of the Nobel Committee are also completely secret for 50 years. But after that, uh, if you beg hard, you add <laughs> are a researcher of intellectual history, you are allowed uh, insight into the um, nominations through all the years. And also the um, uh, consultants reports on the various candidates that uh, were in the shortlist that around 10, 15 uh, persons each year. Mm. And these uh, reports, uh, even if you are not permitted uh, to, to have any, in, in, you cannot see any notes or anything about re, uh, minutes from meetings are strictly forbidden. But by these reports, you can see the basis for the discussion and they are so revealing uh, uh, mm -hmm. about the uh, lack of contact, the com complete disconnect from the very beginning uh, of the prize from the ideas on Nobel. You can see the use of this term, um, the uh, prize, uh, the peace prize or for peace work. That is the word they have uh, uh, interpreted, but it is their own word of their own choice and they can mean absolutely anything. Mm. Uh, it, so, uh, they have they have for entirely forgotten uh, the testament and its letters and its idea. It has never been of interest. So the Nobel Peace Prize never happened. Hmm. And and now I have seen. I looked at the I think 110 uh, prizes uh, given in total, uh, at least the persons. Um, and there are also prices for institutions and organizations. Uh, I've been, I found that there are only 33 of the prices that can reasonably be acceptable. And of course that is a negative and uh, <laughs> discomforting th uh, conclusion to find. But actually what is so interesting is to find who they left out, who should have received the prizes in all these years. And, and uh, th that uh, work, looking for those in the files of the Nobel uh, Committee, uh, brings out the, the history of political idea, uh, of peace ideas uh, for through 120 years. Mm -hmm. um, it is a fantastic uh, parade of uh, completely forgotten and suppressed ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a, it's a kind of unique uh, history written. It, 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 wow. uh, and I, I've been told that the, uh, by one who really knows, it, it's an enormous literature on the Peace Prize uh, mm -hmm. uh, over the years. Uh, and no one has looked at, uh, there are some others who also have seen the archives, but none have used it with a knowledge uh, uh, of what Nobel actually intended and uh, tested the decisions against the actual idea of the will. Uh, um, so uh, an expert in Britain uh, called Peter van den Dungen is more knowledgeable knowledgeable about these things than most of us and mm -hmm. and he says it's the most important interesting and uh, original uh, book on the nobel peace prize ever mm -hmm. so <laughs> i mm -hmm. hope it will 
I, I think it's also by uh, rendering this uh, history of uh, peace ideas over all these years, I have given a, a very useful tool for the peace movement. Uh, understanding its past and uh, understanding how it landed where it is today and uh, getting a very important impulse on where to go in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, and with me, my uh, point of departure that uh, weapons can never uh, be a, uh, give us peace. Uh, I also end up uh, with uh, ideas for uh, on on the disarmament work of the United Nations and the fine initiative by uh, General Secretary Antonio Guterres in 2018 with a long report and initiative. And I I also analyze why this cannot work. Mm. Uh, and I say that if we are to solve this problem, we must start with a very firm understanding that the only improvement possible with militarism is to reject it entirely. Mm -hmm. We must start from there. Otherwise, you are get into a labyrinth of all kinds of uh, difficulties. Mm -hmm. And that's definitely the position of, of Sutner as well. And yeah, that is. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. So, yeah, thanks to her encounter with Nobel, you know, here we are. Yeah. Um, and so I'm going to just open it up to anybody else to see if they have a question. And yeah, if, so, go ahead, Taylor. So, I, one thing that struck me is when you were speaking about peace work and how it was, when you were speaking earlier about money and how we have all this money being put aside for wars and, and different things um, and how that money could be used for peace work. I think it's really interesting because unless I'm mistaken, the Nobel Prize comes with so much so much more resources for peace work, especially small organizations or um, individuals working ad hoc for peace. Um, and yet whenever they give these peace prizes to um, the world leaders, um, these are people who already have a lot of resources to do things. Um, you know, even setting aside their credentials, it seems to me like Nobel's intent was to provide money and resources for peace work rather than a prize for people to spend um, purely for their own, you know, enjoyment. Um, and that recognition and legitimacy also is supposed to lend support to their peace work. And I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit on that, if that is, you know, was Nobel's intent um, for that money to be used for peace work um, and how exactly the committee has or has not been implementing that. I tried my best. The, the sound was not very strong there, so I didn't uh, get entirely what you said, but uh, uh, I think from what I, <laughs> from what I took, what I took from it is uh, uh, it's certainly you have a very strong point in that uh, the idea of the prize was to enable further peace work that the um, recipient should be uh, a, a person needing the money for further work for global disarmament and um, uh, it, therefore the use of the prize for all kinds of precedents uh, in, uh, in Egypt or Israel or, or America uh, and, uh, and, and, and all kinds of institutions like, for instance, the prize for uh, the, the chemical convention five years ago. Uh, they are these are not uh, champions of peace in the sense of uh, grassroots. Uh, I think that is a very important uh, element of this, that it, he wanted to, to strengthen uh, Sutner and her political friends. That is the people really struggling and needing money for their peace work. And it is absolutely impossible for me to understand why 
the peace movement is so, I mean, even if since I have been telling this for 13 years, that the prize is ours for disarmament work. It's the most controversial issue, uh, 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 pol political issue in this field, because you can discuss all kinds of things. But if you really start to touch the, this core uh, prob core uh, element uh, of disarmament, it, that is the last thing uh, the establishment uh, uh, with a, in, in view of the political power of militarism it's the last thing they want to discuss and here we have really a right a legal right to have it discussed and to ha to be heard and to get the money and the peace movement is struggling to raise money and fundraise all the time and uh, use lots of times on that. Uh, why not uh, say, give a little support to the idea that that the peace prize, uh, not only the money, but also the prestige belongs to us. Are there any of Nobel's, I mean, even if he has heirs that can, you know, make a complaint, um, you know, the heirs may not necessarily care about his, this is always, you know, the problem of the dead that, yeah. <laughs> that they can't, they can't exercise their will from beyond the grave and they depend on us and the so-called trustees, people that we trust to yeah. carry out our intent. And is there, is there anyone, you know, um, in his, in his family that, that also can can get a hearing from the committee, or is, is it basically just you? Uh, they don't listen to me, but I should, <laughs> I should listen <laughs> to the family. Uh, and uh, and uh, there is a, uh, a, a quite strong uh, Nobel family uh, organization, family club, or what you I don't the mm. uh, family association, Nobel family association, mm. and. Uh, uh, I think it makes an impression when they speak about this, but they have not really taken action mm. so far. Mm -hmm. uh, I think yeah. they should do that. Okay. And do you know how many people are in that association? I, I can't tell. I yeah. don't know. I, I'm just, I'm familiar with some of these family associations and, you know, it's not like they're harmonious all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so, so even if there is a family association, you know, there could be factions and, and this kind of thing. I'm sure, um, yeah. Yeah. So um, I think there is one, per one person in the family association who is, I mean, they, uh, they need only have one uh, <laughs> army general <laughs> yeah, or, right. or one friend of <laughs> And one, one who believes in armaments uh, around and he will stop any action from the family. Right, right. Yeah, so this is the challenge. Um, so again, th thank you for, for all of your work and, and bringing this to consciousness and, and having us reflect on, on the, the will and the history that it comes out of. And, and I, I really yeah, like this point also that you know, your, your work is helping to educate people about this period of history, which is so crucially important. That's what we try to do on this show is, you know, have, have these dialogues about this period in history and, and these values and the normative framework that has been um, bequeathed to us that we're still working on. Um, <clears throat> kind of address this a little bit, but, you know, going back to the language, there's this phrase, um, and perhaps you can pronounce it in Swedish. Uh, the English rendering is champions of peace. Um, can you talk about that as well as helping us to understand his meaning and intent, Nobel's? Yeah, champions of uh, peace. Um, he, he called this um, uh, fredsförfektare. Uh, <laughs> it's people who advocate peace, champions mm. of peace. Uh, it's interesting, this was uh, not used to explain the, his intention. It mm -hmm. was uh, in the part, a different part of the uh, will where he uh, explains what, who shall award the different prizes, like the 
uh, Academy of Science or the Academy of Literature, Swedish Academy. And then the prize for the champions of peace shall be awarded by a committee of five uh, appointed by the Norwegian parliament. So it was quite, in a kind, uh, <laughs> without, what do you call it? Unintendedly, he, he, he used a very revealing phrase. Uh, and and, and um, I, I think, given the uh, history of Bertha von Suttner and the close connection that the letters show, the correspondence shows this connection with Suttner. Um, uh, so, it's no, in my mind, it no, uh, th this is the strongest word in the, to, yeah. to explain who he had in mind. Uh, uh, because, um, as my Swedish publisher said, uh, you should that word. Hmm. You sh you should focus on that because that they can never get away from. Hmm. Uh, so uh, it it is uh, explained in the whole correspondence where where he, uh, they discuss the peace activities and the uh, activists of the period uh, and um, uh, and they discuss uh, Sutner's uh, friends and activities uh, in the peace movement, uh, grassroots movements at the time and in the International Peace Bureau, uh, which was formed in 1892 uh, and which Norway was uh, the first nation to uh, send funding to. So that is a very important it, reason why the prize went to Norway was that Nobel must have known the Norwegian um, fancy or liking for, for the peace movement. Mm. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I Thank don't you. have a lot more to say. Yeah, good. Uh, anybody else with a question, follow up, etc.? Yeah, I, um, I have a question. It's kind of a, a you know, zooming out big picture thing. Um, I'm not like, could you help me understand what an example would be of one of the prizes that went to someone that clearly seems to defy Alfred Nobel's will and what his intentions were for the prize? Because I'm not, I don't like nothing comes to my mind immediately. And I'm curious if you could help me understand sort of where, where things have gone off the rails. Well, uh, they have never uh, uh, understood the main obligation to use the price to promote the idea of global demilitarization. So that is one thing missing with all the prices. But uh, I mean, uh, <laughs> there are all the prices for uh, political and military leaders are uh, wrong. Mm -hmm clearly wrong. Obama, I used in my first book uh, I, in 2010, I studied his speech and his price uh, over around 16 or 17 pages. I think for Americans, it's very interesting reading. Uh, and then I should stress that my main uh, demand for the committee is to uh, use reasons that promote the actual intention of the prize. So uh, here, uh, Malala Yousafzai from uh, Pakistan, now living in, in Britain, is a very good example because everyone thinks that is a prize for education of women or young girls, uh, an education prize. Uh, but, and therefore, she was clearly, they, they don't show that she is, uh, that she deserves an, a, a Nobel Prize. But it would be easy for them to point out how she had opposed uh, militarism and war in uh, her home, Swat Valley in Pakistan. And then when she came to fame afterwards, uh, she was in the White House. Uh, in uh, October 2013 with Obama. Uh, and um, 
she told him that the dr drone wars is not a good idea. They will alienate people and uh, create terrorists. So please stop that, Mr. President. That was a fantastic chance for the committee to engage and uh, make the whole youth of all over the world enthusiastic about uh, the idea of the price and military disarmament. And I think young people understand this much better and clearer uh, than grown up people who have accustomed to the world as it is. Mm. Uh, young people see the total madness of uh, killing and war and they have a natural reaction against it, which has been uh, uh, corrupted in, in grown up people. Mm. And actually, um, to Randy's question about examples of, of the prize gone wrong, um, I do have a clip. It's about one minute long. I'm going to play it. And this clip is from um, an interview. You can watch the whole interview on our show resources page. It's an Al Jazeera interview, I think from 2010. And Frederick is featured in the interview. And they're discussing, yeah, the, the criticism of uh, the Nobel Peace Prize uh, in China with Liu Xiaobo. It's very interesting. Um, in this clip, they are, yeah, the, the, the journalist is mentioning wrong prizes. So it's about a minute long. Well, when Alfred Nobel died, his will was very clear. The Peace Prize was to be given to the person who shall have done the most for fraternity between nations, the abolition or reduction of standing armies, and promotion of peace congresses. Some say past winners haven't always fell into these categories, though. In 1973, Henry Kissinger won the award for his work on the Vietnam Peace Accords, even though he had instituted the secret bombing campaign against the North Vietnamese Army. In 1978, Menachem Begin was awarded, despite being responsible for the King David Hotel bombing in 1946. In 1994, Yasser Arafat, Shimon Peres and Yitzhak Rabin were bestowed for efforts to bring reconciliation in the Middle East. A lasting peace, of course, remains elusive, with many observers laying the blame on them. And then last year, Barack Obama was awarded for efforts to strengthen cooperation between peoples, a nomination that came just 12 days into his presidency. So, yeah, um, I think that that clip really sums up some of the um, greatest hits of <laughs> individuals who have not, you know, uh, or warranted the prize. Um, and so... Uh, there it is. Go ahead, Frederick, if you have comments on that. Kiss, kissing, you know, good, good to remind, he, he is the worst ever, uh, <laughs> I think. Uh, and he created a huge scandal in Norwegian politics and a debate and a really uh, much turmoil in the Norwegian parliament for once, <laughs> one, mm -hmm. one and only. Um, and uh, also, uh, he had uh, what do you call it this design or um, the, the Ch Chile uh, the attack on uh, Salvador Allende and the, the fall of uh, democracy in uh, in Chile had happened only three four months uh, mm -hmm. before he got the peace prize mm -hmm. it, it's absolutely absurd mm -hmm. uh, so I also have in this new book uh, some explanations of secret meeting, meetings in the State Department uh, uh, on how they would, uh, their plans on how to conceal the U.S. involvement in that uh, coup in Chile hmm. in 73. Well, um, so... We have talked about you know, some of the various factors which explains why the committee does not uh, give a proper acknowledgement to Nobel's intent. Um, 
I don't think you use the phrase in this show, but it's it's in your book, the military industrial complex, um, militarism itself. I think forgetfulness as well, and just this sort of, you know, people hear the word peace and they have their own meaning of it and, and they associate it with like doing good. And as you point out uh, in the book and also in this discussion, that's not what the Peace Prize is for. It's more narrow and specific. And so it's not necessarily for human rights. Um, it's not necessarily for promoting democracy. It is for, you know, <clears throat> the demilitarized approach to security. Um, and so there are other, in addition to like forgetfulness and the power of the military industrial complex and these ideas of security that continue to persist, um, there are other factors that also have contributed to just the fact that, you know, the intent is not looked at. And in your book, you talk about the role of the, the importance of the secretary of no, the Nobel Committee. Uh, and you say that in 1946, um, with the secretary named August Shu, I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name correctly, but that's really when like the mistake really began. And can you talk about that? Well, that's about the tendency they have to, it started with this Scow, uh, Scow secretary okay. <laughs> in 46. He, he said that, of course, uh, the, in the question of uh, disarmament, um, it's not possible for Nobel to explain all this in one single document. So he, he, you have to... Uh, to understand his attitude to to this issue, you have to take a wide look on his whole life and his uh, many ideas on the subject over a, a lifetime. And uh, the same thing is being uh, claimed by a later secretary, uh, Gay Lundestad. Uh, he also wants to, uh, to 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 uh, to consider all the different uh, phases of Nobel's uh, mm. development of his ideas. But the point is, the, the, the what's relevant is what was his idea at the specific time mm -hmm. when he signed the will in the Swedish club in Paris on 27 November um, 1895. What did he have in mind? exactly at that point mm. and then even if he had been uh, doubtful and had various ideas about uh, collective uh, defense and, uh, and, uh, and other <laughs> uh, attack uh, mili using military strength against uh, um, uh, one who uh, an, uh, an aggressive nation the, the point is that in the will, hmm. he had given up all these ideas and he had taken Sutner's view. And he writes expressly getting rid of any military establishment, getting rid of standing armies. Mm -hmm. So there is no doubt. And, and, and even if I have written this book in 2010 and have argued... Uh, extensively uh, against uh, this and it, they just keep claiming the same thing uh, Mr. Lundestein in later books uh, as if I never wrote anything it's being completely ignored and they have the strength to do that mm. because uh, the, they are in line with uh, the general uh, defense policy of Norway is, is guiding the peace prize Mm. Uh, management. So I say it's a disaster that um, the, the, the price has uh, been colored by Norwegian foreign policy instead of vice versa. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fascinating. So in some of my classes, and there's some, some of you on this call may remember this point, uh, you know, you know, we, we look at ancient Greek philosophy, and I, I use this concept that I call the politics of definitions. And um, anybody who studies law knows that 
<laughs> whether you whether you take a broad or narrow view of a definition, you know, this is a, a, a political thing, politics of definitions. And yeah. this is really coming up in the issue of his intent. And I just want to, you know, put it out there that you're you're claiming that the various secretaries of the Norwegian Nobel Committee have an overly broad interpretation of his of Nobel's intent and one that is tainted by uh, the foreign policy and defense posture of Norway, just as emotions might taint our interpretation of a, a definition um, that these extraneous factors are uh, in fact tainting the interpretation of the Nobel committee and making it overly broad. And you're pointing out that this is a very specific thing and we have to look at his intent at the time. And I just, I just want to, it's a, I've beaten the horse, but it's a horse that needs to be beaten, I believe. Yeah. Um, so, so um, and then something happened with the, like, how you become a member of the Norwegian Nobel Committee, the, the process by which you get on the committee. Can you talk about how that changed and what happened in 1948? Well, uh, up to that, uh, Point in '48, they had at least uh, uh, thought that the members uh, should have some knowledge of international politics. Uh, they did not require uh, a, a knowledge of the will because that was never interesting. Or what Nobel intended was never interesting. But you know, it got much worse mm -hmm. in 1948 when Labour had gotten a. a an absolute majority, and they wanted to have uh, their people placed in as many uh, committees as possible. And then uh, they also wanted to have uh, a mathematical uh, formula for uh, allocating the seats in the Nobel Committee. It should be on the base of strength in the last Norwegian election. Uh, and the conservatives were very much against it and protested on principled grounds and that it was irrelevant in this uh, uh, for this election and and the, and the, the and it would do great harm to the prize if they it would bring in uh, um, wrong. Uh, irrelevant uh, motives in the election process. Mm -hmm. This is really what happened. Now, uh, since 48, the prices have been the, owned by the strongest political parties. The main political parties have placed uh, their uh, favored uh, <laughs> people all uh, the party members to be uh, remunerated with a, a very attractive seat. Uh, and, and, and this selection of the parties uh, with no regard to Nobel is automatically uh, rubber stamped by the parliament mm -hmm. as an automatic. And I have been trying again and again to get them understand that uh, it follows from the testament that uh, parliament should select the persons with the best knowledge and intention and uh, dedication to the ideas of the will. Uh, this has been ignored. I mean, hmm. letters to the president of parliament has never had any uh, effect. Uh, because this is, this is uh, the, the idea of the prize runs counter to the uh, uh, main idea of Norwegian foreign policy, which is to be a loyal member of NATO and to, uh, to, to pursue military strength. That is uh, Norwegian politics. And it, it's exactly the opposite of Nobel's intention. Mm -hmm. And it's not so bad. You, you, you will not believe that in the latest um, selection of committee members, which happened uh, uh, on 
just uh, six weeks ago on uh, December 7 uh, last year, um, I was able to get uh, a proposal, a, pro um, uh, 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 a proposal voted on in Parliament requiring that uh, the, the, the candidates must be dedicated to the intention of Nobel, mm. which I think this uh, to to make them the right uh, committee to, to 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 select the committee to the Nobel committee the parliament should have voted uh, around at least 95 percent for this resolution mm. and will you believe it only two persons supported it <laughs> uh, so there is a 98 0.7% of parliament voted against taking Nobel into consideration. Well, I think that 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 leaves some soil in such a thing. Yeah. Um, it's incredible. It's incredible. Yeah. And um, I, I do think uh, just before the show, when we when we went, when we started recording, we were talking about um, I think that you know this respect of Nobel's intent. Um, this is an issue for all of us because all of us are going to die, um, and we have a choice as to what what we do with what we leave behind. And um, and I think that this is connected to you know our notion of of autonomy and and self. And the deep philosophical question here is how much control do you give the individual over his, her, or their self, um, self-construction in the world. And when you allow extraneous elements into it, you know, you're really undermining autonomy and you're also undermining trust because of course, Nobel trusted the Norwegian parliament to carry through with his wishes. And so um, I think that there's this, a, 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 another conversation for another day about how this kind of attitude uh, is really undermining some extremely important important values. Um, uh, I'm going to open it up to anybody else. And then we're going to just shift because we've been going for over an hour to we want to get in um, some some of Frederick's comments about the nuclear issue and um, uh, the Treaty for the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. And um, before we get there, does anybody else have a question or comment? Uh, I'll make a brief comment. Um, I, I feel like, you know, I'm not as educated on this issue, but I, there's been a tremendous um, criticism of the prize today. And I think that we all feel, at least as far as I can tell, like there's something noble about the prize. So like the idea behind it is something worth holding on to and perhaps returning to. And and so I just wanted to sort of say that as a way of, you know, just reminding whoever might be listening that we're not trying to say there shouldn't be a prize or, or you know, we're trying to make a specific case that the prize needs to be given out in a way that is true to the intent, true to the original uh, purpose. And we're, you know, I just wanted to say that so that it's not just Nobel Peace Prize bashing. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I, I'm very happy you said that because I, I also try uh, always to, to make it clear that this is not a criticism of uh, all the fine persons who have won the prize. Uh, the, there are lots of people who have uh, deserved very fine peace prizes. It's just that if the prize shall make a difference, uh, it needs to have an idea and a direction, and it will mm. not, not achieve any change in 300 years uh, where, when it's being done like now. It's being thrown out in all directions for all kinds of purposes without any idea or plan on, mm. on how Nobel had a wonderful plan and that's uh, it's very wrong 
uh, to him and to the world and to the, all the citizens of the world uh, that, uh, that Norway is not respecting uh, the intention. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, I will just comment and say thank you to Frederick for all of your work. Truly, this issue is one up until today that I have been truly ignorant of. And to truly get an insight into, to go off what Randy said, what is still considered to be a very well-renowned, respected prize given out to individuals who, for some of them, have done a lot of incredible work. But to understand that it is not coming directly from what Alfred Nobel's intent was. I find that to be very fascinating. So I thank you for go undergoing this effort despite all of the criticism and hardships and truly bringing this to light. I think it's very important. Well, thank you. And I think it's so interesting and almost a paradox that by studying the Peace Prize, I really start to understand why we never get rid of war. Mm. It is a very extremely interesting uh, um, elimination of political processes and, uh, and forces and the root causes of war. And uh, in my new book, I have uh, a long chapter on what I call the criminal overworld. Mm. Uh, and by that, I mean uh, these networks uh, of secret... Uh, what you call it, intelligence services and their political uh, acti active activists from the uh, uh, arms industry uh, and, and all the interests that drive war forward uh, and uh, who the politicians uh, end up being helpers of a very evil system and a very dangerous system. Uh, it can uh, mean the end of us any time if we don't get rid of nuclear weapons. Mm. Uh, I, 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 my analysis is that uh, uh, we, we have a wrong understanding of the conflict in the world. Because uh, we uh, look at countries uh, opposing each other with their military uh, arsenals. But uh, actually, it's the militaries with countries that stand against each other. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and the, I, in actual fact, they are not against each other because they are depending on each other. It's a system where they all the time have to have enemies and to scare people and to create conflicts in, in order to... That is a necessary part of the business plan of... Uh, a huge part of our economy mm. and 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 i think the uh, budget system in the u.s congress uh, one thing is that it um, allocates enormous amounts uh, over half of the federal budget to to military purposes uh, but the other part which i think is overlooked which i found in forbes magazine is that yeah, there is no control of the spending. So they are spending many times over the amount that is actually allocated uh, as money that cannot be accounted for. And that is be being permitted year after year. It, this goes on. Uh, and of course, if you have that kind of uh, free use of uh, Govern public money uh, without any control. You have uh, such enormous chances of uh, uh, corrupt profits, and, and and it's a very strong factor driving this uh, together uh, forward all the time, uh, with a consequence for all other nations because they have to relate to it, and they have to either. Uh, seek refuge by, by uh, being a part of it, uh, or they have to try to defend themselves against it. But from this uh, lack of uh, budgetary control in uh, the US military, uh, that shapes the whole 
uh, world system mm -hmm. and keeps us uh, locked in something where <laughs> the real conflict to get back to that is between all the inhabitants of the planets, the people who live in all countries, are have one common interest against the military of their own country and of all other countries. Mm. That, that is the main conflict in the world. Thank you for those comments, Frederick. And um, yeah, we've, we've been going for about 90 minutes and we're gonna start to, to wind down the uh, very interesting dialogue. There's so much so much to learn and um i i want to you know just transition to nuclear weapons which you just what you just mentioned and um you as we said in the beginning of the show you you've worked a lot on the nuclear disarmament issue and you know you're a lawyer and you're a peace activist and <clears throat> you also you worked on something called the world court project and i was just wondering if you could just remind us what that is yeah, it's uh, one of the big civil society projects of the uh, 1990s, uh, with um, uh, one where, of the very successful ones were the mine campaign uh, with Jody Williams and the mm -hmm. landmine campaign. Uh, uh, this um, uh, work to try to outlaw mm -hmm. nuclear weapons. Uh, by a decision from the World Court or the International Court of Justice at The Hague in the Netherlands, mm -hmm. the, the UN Court. Mm -hmm. It started in um, 1992 and um, uh, now it's all this many problems starting a case, uh, a lawsuit, <laughs> uh, because uh, you have to have standing to sue and uh, in this world court, uh, only nations have a uh, standing to sue, or the UN, uh, where the, the General Assembly has a right to ask for an advisory opinion in a legal issue uh, from the court. And also uh, these um, specified special agencies of the UN, like the World Health Organization can ask uh, such a, a question to the court. And the, now the, uh, this question of the illegality of nuclear weapons, uh, to get that to the court required an enormous mobilization of uh, civil society all over the world, uh, mm. which that was called the World Court Project. And it was absolutely incredible, uh, all the organize, organizing that went into it. Uh, and it finally managed to 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 to, to launch um, a resolution in the UN General Assembly that led to uh, the World Court coming into action. And uh, uh, there, Ayalana and uh, and civil society were very active in uh, assisting the states in their pleadings in the court in Hague, mm. uh, at The Hague, and the, the decision uh, was handed down on July 8, in, uh, 1996, mm. uh, and it outlawed the nuclear weapons, mm. uh, both the uh, possession and, uh, and threat. Uh, and um, then there was also a very interesting remark uh, by the court on the obligation after the uh, nuclear non-proliferation treaty, uh, non-proliferation and nuclear disarmament would be the better name, uh, that there is an obligation uh, under Article 6 uh, to sit down and negotiate a treaty on abolition of nuclear arms. Uh, mm -hmm. And the, the court, uh, even if it was divided in <laughs> and the nuclear 
nations were uh, dragging their feet in the main issue. They, they, on this issue, there was an, an unanimous finding that the, the uh, nations had this obligation to negotiate in good faith and, in fact, reach a specific result of the negotiation, a treaty on abolition of nuclear arms in its entirety. And the nations have not honored that obligation uh, in any way. I mean, they, they, mm -hmm. they are still now that these um, some states have got together and uh, made sure that there was this uh, um, uh, treaty on abolition of nuclear weapons uh, three years ago. Uh, they have not been part of the negotiations and they have refused to honor the uh, uh, obligation to assign it, which they are obliged to mm. by the court's decision in, 18, in, in 1996. Mm. That's a fascinating claim. <laughs> I wish we had more time to discuss it, but I just want to thank you because I'm an, an absolute, you know, an heir to the uh, efforts of the World Court Project, because what, what turned me on to the peace through law movement was that 90, 1996 ICJ advisory opinion. I took a class in law school called International Law and Weapons of Mass Destruction, and we focused on that advisory opinion. And I had no idea uh, as a philosopher, you know, we're, it's, I was a philosopher first and, and lawyer second, and I had no idea of, of really the, the International Court of Justice, The Hague, et cetera, and um, that course opened the door for me. And I um, am a beneficiary of that earlier work. And so this is amazing. It's the 25th anniversary of that advisory opinion. And um, just yeah, six days ago, the Treaty for the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons entered into force. And we've, we've talked about that treaty um, for the last three weeks on this show. And that one of the really wonderful things coming out of the ICANN campaign, it's the International Campaign for the Abolition of Nuclear Weapons, is just the sort of the education that's going on um, that um, the you know, you were talking about the, the, the economic aspect and Vanda Prashkova has been on this show and she does youth engagement around the nuclear disarmament issue and um, move the nuclear weapons money and divestment campaigns. And, and of course the relationship between the nuclear weapons and the environment. Um, so all of these other issues that campaign and engaging young people um, is, is doing that. And that's a that's tied to your work and bringing that to the um, International Court of Justice. So thank you for all of that work. And um, we'll close by just reminding people that, you know, the Nobel Peace Prize did go to the International Campaign for the Abolition of Nuclear Weapons in 2017. And in 1995, it went to Joseph Rotblat and the Pugwash Conferences on Sciences and World Affairs. And we've done a couple of shows on the um, Russell Einstein Manifesto, uh, which which sort of stimulated, uh, Rotblat was a signer of that manifesto and um, he started to convene these conferences. And so 1995, they win the prize. And so presumably Frederick, you think that these prizes um, are correct. And can you just remind us why the Nobel committee maybe got it right in these cases? Was that the question? Yeah, the question was just, do you agree that the um, the Nobel Peace Prize is going to Rotblat, the Pugwash Yeah, conferences? yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, absolutely, absolutely. And, and, um, that's, and because yeah. of the emphasis on um, the abolition or reduction of standing armies like that, yeah. that bit. Um, mm. But do you consider uh, the Pugwash Conference a Peace Congress? I, that again is... Uh, this literary, <laughs> thing. It, 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 the, the prize is for, for uh, uh, Berta von Suttner's uh, political ideas and her political mm. friends. It's about global um, initiatives to create a demilitarized world. 
that is interpretations of what it was intended by the will. And, uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. You'll all find this very, uh, very e easy to understand from the book. Uh, uh, and, and also there is a lot about it on the website um, nobelwill.org mm -hmm. from Nobel Peace Prize Watch. Uh, and there we will also post the new uh, nominations that we have got hold of uh, or partly written ourselves uh, they will be uh, published i think uh, at midnight on january 31 when the the um, uh, time limit expires and uh, but i would also very much like to add hope that it was very very interesting to hear that you had been inspired uh, by the World Court Project, that, that was what, what awakened you to an awareness of this subject and the, the cause. And, and, uh, and it is, a, again, an, uh, a very important example of, of that we don't know all the effects of what we are doing. And mm. that uh, it, 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 there are so many more effects of what we are doing that than we can imagine, and uh, it's fantastic that this was that this helped you on a good uh, course in life. Yeah, yeah. I mean, really, it's true. I mean, I, I I always tell that story. I think you know, Randy can is my witness. Um, yeah, I just, and I and I, I just yeah. I, yeah, I just did a podcast with um, the UN Library and Archives in Geneva, and they asked how I became interested, and I talk about um, yeah the the advisory opinion case. So, and indeed that will continue for people mm. like long after we're gone. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, and you, yeah, you, there's no way you can know um, how it will affect people, impact people. And I think, you know, Bertha is another example, which is of course, she's well before uh, the, the United Nations, yeah. uh, but her, as we use on this show, the, the phrase is moral energy uh, and as Randy has pointed out, energy can neither be created nor destroyed. <laughs> so uh, her moral energy persists. And um, when you have an encounter with her, as Randy pointed out, you know, you can't help but sort of like be compelled by this story. And, and we, at least I, um, and I think all of us on this show have been compelled to like do a deeper dive into her. And of course that brings us to Nobel and the encounter between her and Nobel and, and that brings us to you. So <laughs> it's all very good. And um, I'll uh, turn it over to Randy for last words and then uh, we, will, we will end this fascinating show. Well then, um, the pressure's on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess what I'll do is try to take a step back. Um, one of the things that I said two weeks ago and I want to echo today is that, you know, there are these, there are certain places where we can go in order to get maybe a more nutritious form of mental food. And what Frederick has made abundantly clear today is that the history of the Nobel Prize proves to be this um, basically infinite resource for understanding history and understanding how and why certain things have taken place. And um, and I think that the nuclear issue is what we were talking about two weeks ago. And I made this, the same point then that there's an entry point into the history of nuclear weapons that has many doors, right? You can go into that story in a whole bunch of different ways and you'll come out of it with a tremendously new uh, way of seeing the world, a new framework. And it seems to me that the history of the Nobel Prize and the intention of Nobel and understanding the links between then and now is a similar kind of gold mine of information. And so my final uh, message here is something like an, uh, an encouragement for anyone who's uh, feels feels so compelled to go out there, dig into some of the information that's publicly available about the Nobel Prize. Like we don't have to dig deep into the archives in order to start to pull out gold, and you know, see what you can find. Great. 
Yeah, well, thank you. And uh, but I, I, this is a systematically suppressed history. So that that's why it has been so interesting to uh, research in it and, and to bring it out. Hmm. Fascinating. So you've been listening to Virtues of Peace and Frederick Heffermel from Oslo, Norway. He has a book from 2010 called The Nobel Peace Prize, What Nobel Really Wanted. You can access information about that book on our show resources page at virtuesofpeace.com. He has this website, nobelwill.org. Again, you can access that on our show resources page as well. I've learned so much from you, Frederick. And so thank you not only for this work on Nobel, but also you know, your work on nuclear disarmament and as a peace activist, uh, as you said quite, <clears throat> quite accurately, like you don't know the effects of all of your work. Um, and so I thank you for planting seeds that will doubtless blossom into you know, other bright points in, the, in our history. Last word, Frederick, and then we'll close out for today. Well, thank you for having me. And I hope I will find an American publisher for the new book. Yeah. Do you have a title for the new book? Well, I call it Behind the Medals. Hmm. The Nobel Peace Prize, 100 Years of Unused Opportunity. Hmm. Wow. Sounds awesome. and. Um, it's in English, correct? Yeah, it has been published in Norwegian, but I made a new version, uh, which is now finished. Um, I have the manuscript ready for publishing, um, and, and it's abbreviated and adapted to, to an international readership. Great. Well, hopefully we'll have you back to talk about that book some more. and. Um, in the meantime, God bless and thank you for all your work. And you have been listening to Virtues of Peace. And thank you. We'll be back in a couple of weeks. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.